looking forward to the opportunity to share with you a little bit about the power of data visualization and how all of that comes together. Most importantly, we've got a lot to cover today and I wanna make sure that we get to all of it, but a key question in thinking about data visualization and the power of it is why. And a big part of the why really comes down to the fact we have so much data coming at us today. Regardless of your role within an organization, you're seeing more data than we've ever seen before. And so in that process, we've got to look for ways to help our teams and individuals be able to understand all of that data and to take and leverage what they do best, what their specific talents are, provided all of that information and make it easy to understand and easy to comprehend. One of the biggest challenges is, is we think about walls of data. A wall of data is all of that information that comes at us in numbers, it comes at us in a lot of different forms. And as we think about those forms, I've heard many of our clients over the years talk about, I feel like there's so much data coming at me. It's all numbers. I'm not good with numbers. How can I, how can I understand all of this? When we talk about big data or small data or data of any shape or size, the key to this is understanding um, what people and how people can consume and digest that information to make the most of that information and put it to work in their specific role. Regardless of the size of your organization, whether you're a small company or a large company, I've heard this referred to. At one of the largest companies in the world where, where you would think they had their arms around these walls of data to present and be as efficient as they look from the outside, they struggled with getting the information in a way that executives, leadership, and individuals could all think about it appropriately. One of the thought leaders in the space of data visualization is Stephen Few. He says and correctly reviews that critical facts can lie hidden in data that can only be seen in a picture. Regardless of the amount of math that we can do, regardless of all the stati statistical analysis that we accomplish over time, many times a picture really helps us understand that data better. And as we think about pictures, I want you to look at Anscombe's Quartet. This is a, data, a very simple data visualization. But what is very unique about this data visualization, as you can see the plotted points and the trend line are, are the plotted points are very different, yet the trend line and key elements of the statistical analysis around these distributions of data would tell the exact same story. But when you look at it visually, you can tell that the universes of data represented in each of the four pictures is very different. And that's why we can't just always rely on numbers. We, we need to leverage visualization to understand, to Fuse point, to understand information hidden in the data. We also need to use this visualization process and data visualization to be able to help ourselves understand the data more quickly. And more importantly, what you're gonna hear me talk a lot about today is audience. We really look at data visualization in two ways. One, it helps us solve very difficult math problems in a simple way to communicate. And two, if we think about the audience, we can start to tailor the, the kind of information that we need to communicate to, to the person. As we think about this, I want to take us back because this is something that we struggle with. A lot of times we are thinking about how I get numbers in front of people so they can distill that. Well, this, this challenge goes back quite a ways. And as we think about this, I want you to think about some movies that were a turning point in, at, that happened during a turning point in our analysis of data. 
These were movies that were at the top of the box office. These were TV shows that were the most popular at the time. And this was Billboard's top albums for the year. Additionally, Apple Computers released the first Mac just a year earlier. I want you to think about what that year was. Think about the movies that are there, the music and the television shows. And I want you to think about what year that is. And it was 1985. Well, why does 1985 resonate big in the year of analytics and how we think about analysis? Well, it's important to understand that that was the year that the most widely used technology for doing analysis was born. Excel. Excel is by far the most widely used tool for analysis. Why this is important and what I want you to glean from this is that Excel is the most widely used tool today, yet it made its debut in 1985. And for a bit of trivia, around Excel, I think it's important to understand that it came out for the Mac because Windows didn't exist. And so as we think about the evolution, how Excel has evolved over time and what its original purpose was, its original purpose was really to take accounting working papers and move them into an electronic version to be easier to work with and to be more what we would consider visual at the time, even though visualization is not included anywhere in the basic functionality of Excel. Well, as data got more complicated, what happened with Excel, a tool designed to replace working papers, is the data got more complex the data got more vast in its, in its volumes. And Excel started being used in ways that Excel wasn't necessarily designed to be used. And it does two things. One, it creates a world, as Price Waterhouse discovered, in a, a broad survey of all of their audit clients, that 88% of all spreadsheets contain an error. And it, as that data expands over 150 rows of data, that moves to 92%. So as we think about how we apply tools and what we look at today, as you expand the volume of data that goes into spreadsheets, we have and we increase the opportunity for errors in that data. And we also just increase the amount of, of text that we're expecting somebody to consume. And what we find in data visualization is that consuming text is not that easy for them to comprehend. Now, one of the things that's interesting is a story that I like to look back to. Um, our former um, CFO at ESIMO, before we became ESIMO Analytics by Cherry Beckert, he was the CFO at a large firm in New York. Seven years later, he came into the back into that firm. We were helping them do some data visualization projects, and they were still using that same Excel sheet. And it dawned on him a couple of things. One, that, hey, now that he understood visualization, he kind of understood how people learn, how people see things. And he also learned that when people see vast amounts of data like you see in Excel and numbers and text and, and, and more copy, they start to gloss over it. And he wondered why his report wasn't as frequently used. And eight years later, when we're coming in talking about those things, he also found that they still weren't looking at it and that when we could deliver on visualization, it made for a stronger, and better communicated use of the data. The concept of data visualization is really simple.
we use data visualization every day. Whether if we're driving a car and we see this data visualization, we know exactly what this means. We're either calling AAA or we've got to find a gas station really quickly. Keeping visualization as simple as possible with a fuel gauge is so everybody can comprehend quickly at a glance, know exactly what their situation is, and based on their background, be able to know what's happening and what action needs to be taken. Those of you with children understand what this means. Those of you without children also know what this means. You sat next to this when restaurants were open in a restaurant or on an airplane. And this means one of two things, either I'm empty or I'm full, and it needs to be dealt with right away. We know what action to take based on the visualization of what we're seeing. And that's what, we're, that's what we want to accomplish with data visualization, is keeping it simple. And it made me think back. It made me think back as I was working with my youngest son on some of his homework when he was just in kindergarten and thinking about we learn the simple ways to communicate math and data questions. Very quickly, we can discern that we have more bananas than apples. We can also very quickly, through the use of the icons, figure out how many of each we have. But what's more important here is the shape and the size of the visualization that gives us insight very quickly into, hey, we've got more bananas. The use of data visualization helps us answer questions and we're able to get at that very quickly and understand it. Now, some early adopters of data visualization happened a long time ago. One that's very relevant today. An epidemiologist named John Snell was challenged with trying to solve the cholera outbreak in London. And they were looking at pages and pages of data. In 1854, they didn't have Excel, but they were writing it down in ledgers. They were writing it down in ledger books and they were writing down every, every occurrence, every patient that had, had come up with cholera. And it wasn't until John Snow, an early data visualizer, decided to start plotting every case of cholera and the location that that person lived on a map. And as you can see here, as I zoom into the map, he ultimately created a bar chart. A bar chart overlaid on a map of London to discover that there was a cluster of cases related to certain pumps in the city of London. Using data visualization, going from a ledger book to a map with bar charts, all of a sudden made the challenge really clear. As we think about another one of our famous historical data visualizers, we are looking at the March on Moscow. Now this visualization is really powerful because it uses a couple of different elements. It uses color and width of a line to, to show Napoleon's March on Moscow and how Many troops is represented by the width, and going towards Moscow is represented by the color, by the tan color, and his retreat from Moscow is shown in black. And you can see how very quickly his advancing towards Moscow, and through that process, he started losing troops, and how few troops he had by the time he returned.
So the first poll question for CPE credit is a true or false? And the question is, Anscom Quartet comprises four data sets that have nearly identical statistics, yet have very yet are very different than when graphed. Please answer the poll question to make sure you get credit. All right. Moving on. So one of the things that comes along, I just showed you two of the best examples of using data visualization. But there are a couple of things that you have to know, and then we're gonna talk about how you make good visualization. But I believe a lot of times if we give people the example of what isn't good that then when we start to learn what is good we're thinking about those things that aren't so one of the most challenging components of data visualization is the pie chart the pie chart is one of the most widely used but this is a very bad example of a pie chart and the reason that this is a bad example of a pie ch pie chart is because there are too many slices to the pie and there's not enough differenti differentiation in those slices. They're not, it's not labeled. We're not using text to do call out. All of these elements, while we might think, wow, well, hey, that pie chart looks okay, it actually doesn't because you should never with a pie chart think about using more than four or five slices. And you need to make sure that there is good differentiation to define that. A lot of times we think then to make a pie chart better that we're going to do it in 3D. Very rarely in, the, in data visualization is making something 3D valuable. And the reason that, that it doesn't make it valuable is because it makes it actually harder to perceive differences. And sometimes it actually, based on this visualization, skews the size of objects. And so we have our, our eye and the, our brain has a harder time differentiating between the slices of the pie when we make it 3D. We think, yes, it looks cool, but by the time we deliver it, it doesn't look, uh, it, it isn't decipherable. We have to really balance what looks cool and what is actually useful. And making sure we think about our audience is critical in that path. Just like the 3D pie chart, a lot of times we think making something 3D looks cool and makes it useful, but it, it actually has the opposite effect. As you look at this 3D bar chart, there's some key elements that are important to see. One, we have three different axes that we're trying to use. And in using those three different axes, we have to spend a lot of time going back and forth between the axes to decipher what we're looking at. But more so, what we run into when we get into 3D is we run into situations like we see here where some of the values are actually hidden behind bars that are higher that are in the foreground. So it becomes very important for us to think about our audience. Audience is one of the key things to data visualization. Finally, this is deemed by Edward Tufte, who was one of the, one of the key thought leaders, um, historical thought leaders in data visualization as the worst chart ever. What, what is, this chart is trying to show is the age structure of college enrollment. It's trying to show that by under 25 and over 25 as a percentage. What it doesn't do is it doesn't really tell the story. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do most of all is tell the story of the data through a data visualization. As we look at this, we can't really interpret it. 
in, in addition to being 3D, colors not really distinguishing different elements, a chart type that no one is familiar with, with an area chart moving both directions, and with a broken scale. So understanding how all of these things fit together becomes very important. To that end, we really want to be able to leverage all the good things that can happen. The reason that visualization is so important is about humans' ability to leverage their visual perception. Our visual system, both consciously and subconsciously, are trying to solve the challenges that we put before it visually. So as we look at information in a visual way, we're putting lots of parts of our brain to work, whereas when we're reading, we're not necessarily putting all of those parts of our brain to work. There are a couple of things that we have to think about. We have to think about the limits of working memory. We have to think about how we leverage our brain and our memory and use it to its strongest effect. And then we need to understand how we take visualization elements and apply the Gestalt principles, which are widely used in all forms of design, whether it's in advertising, um, whether it's in architecture, whether it is in data visualization, those principles help us tell stories with data for people to consume and hold on to. So to understand this, we have to understand a little bit of how the human brain works. We have to understand the types of memory. Iconic is, are those things that we recognize and relate to immediately. That's why they're called icons on a computer screen. It's the things that we immediately see and know and how to react to. Our working memory is what we're processing at any given time. It's, it's what we're working on. It's me giving this presentation. It's you listening to this presentation. Our long-term memory is where we're taking what's coming in, of, in our working memory, what we're wanting to store to use later, or what we're using in our working memory to pull back from. If you think about it like a computer, a lot of times we think about long-term as the hard drive, where we're storing stuff to pull it back in later, where our working memory is what's in RAM, what we're working on right now. The key thing about working memory is it's temporary. So we have to grab attention with iconic uses, and then we need to make sure we're getting the information across that needs to be consumed in our working memory. A big portion of our working memory uses visual perception and visual cues to process information. The one thing, another thing we have to remember is it has limited capacity. What that really drives is a lot of times, I'm sure you've seen dashboards that have so much stuff on them that it takes forever to get through them, it gets, takes forever to review them, and then by the time you're reviewing it, you've forgotten where you started. And so as we think about that, we've also got to remember that the principles of design and the principles of keeping things simple always have to be at the forefront, no matter how complex the analytics that we're completing. We can be doing complex forecasting, or we can be doing in-depth regression analysis to get to correlations. But our output, the part that we interact with, the part that our audience works with, it is very important that we keep those things simple and, and keep them, keep in mind the tools we have available. As we think about the Gestalt principles that I mentioned before, there are elements of design that help draw attention and help us process information more quickly. So as an example, the proximity 
of plotted points or the proximity of information to another has an impact in how we view it. If you look at the item on the left, everything is bunched together. It all appears to be together. Simply by spreading out groups of two, that proximity, our, our eyes now start to follow that down the page, number one, but also divides it into three distinct groupings. Similarity is also something we can use. Now, similarity can be shape, it can be color, it can be consistency in how something is presented. And in that, that helps us identify, process information more quickly, and spend less of our time working on that processing like when we're reading. Enclosure, we see this all the time in data visualization where we want to identify something, we can enclose it. We can either enclose it like we did with the two lines around it on the top, or just enclose it by shading. We can also use closure that our brain expects, like we did with enclosure, or we can break up that closure. And if we break up that closure, then that also draws our attention because our brains want to finish the square or the rectangle. If it isn't finished, then it becomes something that our brains want to solve, so it draws our attention to something that isn't closed. Continuity. I want you to follow the lines and follow the colors and see where your eyes go. If you're following the red line, even though the red goes straight from top to bottom, that continuity, you're expecting to follow it to the, down to the bottom where the dots turn black. And then ultimately connection. When we connect things, our brain is processing that the dots are moving from left to right. If we would have connected them, if I would have connected those dots top to bottom, your eyes, our brains would have perceived that as moving top to bottom. As we move through the different options that we have, I want you to see how this really works. As we encode data for rapid perception, here's a whole bunch of numbers. This is what the spreadsheet looks like. I want you to tell me, take 10 seconds and tell me how many fives are there. I want you to just think about it. Tell it to yourself. How many fives are in the list? All right, time's up. Now, if I move forward and I use a simple element of design being color, now I want you to count the fives. Was that easier? It's much easier because using color helps that stand out. If I think about taking it a step further, what if I make it bigger? That also works. I can use color, I can use size, and I can make this easier. If I start to combine all of them, color, size, the concept of enclosure, it makes it even easier to count all of the fives. So as we think about the different things that we can do to help encode, help our audience, and that's who we're focused on, the people who need to use the data, whether that's executives, whether that's leaders, whether that's managers or individual contributors, we need to help them understand things better. The way that we can do that is using color. We can use hue or intensity. We can use positioning, as we saw with some of the Gestalt principles. We can use motion. We can cause things to move or we can take elements of our data and just make changes to them from one element to another. 
then there are form elements we can use, whether we're using lines and lengths or widths, the direction that things are moving, or the orientation in which they sit. We can leverage size, like we did before, shape. We can add mark elements, and we can use enclosure to make all of these things more successful. So here's our next poll question. True or false? The Gestalt principles of visual perception include proximity, similarity, enclosure, closure, continuity, and connection. True or false? Give you a second to finish that. All right. The way that we leverage some of these things in form or shape or other elements for our visual perception, in color, in line thickness. So if we think about line and bar charts, if we take the thin line and the colors to differentiate in each of these examples, our minds perceive them differently. One, use of color helping to separate the lines lets us draw distinct perceptions of talking about discrete or distinct data between the two lines. The use of size and thickness can help, help us emphasize and draw attention to what we're looking at. We can also leverage size and color and other elements in two other chart types. As we look at this map chart of Airbnb in San Francisco, we can see how the use of color draws our attention to different areas of, the, of different neighborhoods, but leveraging size starts to tell us the amount of listings that occur there. And then being able to use those same colors and translate them over to the box and whiskers plot gives us the ability to now have a common thread between the two sides and help people perceive information more quickly. Key elements that we can use besides size is text. Too much text can be bad. Not enough text can be not descriptive enough. The key is determining how to make readability the key. Make the most important information stand out. We see this a lot when we do call outs. Or a lot of the tools today, whether that's Tableau or Power BI or other um, data visualization tools, give you the ability to highlight specific points and only label those with text. So not every point on your chart is labeled, only the ones that you really need to call out. In building a visual story and taking the most of visualization, you have to understand the foundations and the foundations are pretty simple. We talked briefly about pie charts. Pie charts, when used correctly, are very powerful. Bar charts are probably the most common, whether they're basic, whether they're histogram, whether they're a bullet chart or a stacked bar chart. All different types of bar are all still bar charts. It's how we leverage those bar charts and what we use them for that it becomes important. Line charts, also very common for sharing about trends, and we're going to talk more about that. Scatter plots looking at distributions. Tables. Tables are still important. While I talk about Excel being complicated at some and complex to perceive, if we're telling the appropriate story and we're working our way from higher level information, 
down to more granular detailed information with more focused rows and columns of data, then cross tabs and highlight tables become very valuable. Additional types of visualizations that we don't think about as often are area charts and bubble charts. Gantt charts are very specific for projects and other things that are dependent where dependencies are needed. Heat maps and tree maps, box and whisker chart like we just saw. And I'm going to go into more detail on many of these and the most common ones here in a minute. But candlestick charts are, are the ones you see most of the time on stocks, on evaluating stocks, where there's a high and a low and an uh, a, a open and a close. And ultimately, how all of that information comes together. One of the most powerful ones that we've seen in the last several years is the ease at which we can put information on maps and how much information that does provide to an audience. One of the most overused and one of the ones that tends to get used most incorrectly are infographics. That's where we try and overlay some cool advertising design components and some data visualization into it. And very frequently, we run into challenges where on the infographics where we're not actually where our story gets lost in trying to be too cute so let's talk about pie charts pie charts as i said are very very powerful tools we've got to remember that we should never have more than four to six slices um, if we have more than four to six slices they get very confusing they're very hard to understand and our visual perception and how our brain works in trying to work with a pie chart is challenged. Bar charts, the most common data visualizations. We want to use these to highlight differences between categories, show outliers, be able to quickly identify and perceive. Now, one of the things that's interesting is a lot of times with bar charts, we run into challenges where all we use are bar charts and we end up with a a visualization story that has 50 bar charts. Part of the challenge with data visualization is finding good balance. Balance between chart types, balance between color, leveraging all of these things at our disposal to make data more clear is critical in our efforts to tell a good data story and empower all of the people we're wanting to empower with the data we're providing. In, in using bar charts, being able to see the differences, being able to see the differences in series is critical. Using bar charts in different ways, creating a bullet chart, for example, is essentially allowing us to create a bar chart inside of a bar chart. Bullet charts show progress, can show progress against a goal. It's really good for when we're wanting to make sure we see our progress towards something, whether we've exceeded it, like we like is visualized here in the east, or whether we're and west or falling short, like we are in the central. This allows us to compare those metrics really quickly. And in this case, we're leveraging what we can see and see where things fall using the background grays to also see where we are as a percentage of quota, not just towards goal, but where what percentiles we're falling in. Line charts are used best when we're wanting to see how things happen over time. When we're wanting to see something over any continuous measure. So if it's over time, if there's some other continuous element that we want to see where we expect a line to be running. Um, one of the key things about line charts, especially if we're using dates to drive our lines, it's very important that we know that, that perception of a line chart is that time is going to move from left to right. If we play with that at all, we have to have a very good reason. And sometimes 
we have a very good reason. We want to attract somebody's attention to something that happened more recently, or we want to attract their attention to how it worked. One of the key things, though, with a line chart is, is we have to be careful. I want you to think about the last time you saw a line chart where time ran from top to bottom. It doesn't happen very often. And one, it can be confusing to an individual and they have to spend the time processing that. So we have to think about how we use those tools and how we put those together. Scatter plots are what I believe are one of the most underutilized tools. Um, as we think about a scatter plot, those scatter plots can provide us a lot of information about how a, a, how a, a distribution or how a universe is behaving and helps us identify those outliers. Whether we're looking at these outliers and this one up here that got cut off a little bit, or that we're looking simply where we're not thinking about a, the needing to know the detail, but being able to see the clustering that's occurring down here and know this is the bulk of where our information is occurring. Using a real world example, we worked with a, a, a manufacturing customer who had 17,000 SKUs in one product line. We were able to put 17,000 plotted points in a scatter chart. In their reporting, they were rolling those up to categories and it was all the cross tab and, and a cross tab piece of information but they had 17,000 SKUs, so then they were rolling it up to subcategories and other things. And in that, they had a gut feeling that they were not being as profitable as they should. And what they discovered was they weren't. They had an opportunity when you dropped on the scatter plot, they found very quickly things, the individual items that were the outliers. Highlight tables we're all familiar with. Um, that's using color in our traditional cross tab to be able to identify and draw attention to different elements of our visualization. The area chart is oftentimes used to replace a line chart incorrectly. Someone wants to use an area chart because they like the more the greater use of color than you get in a line chart and so I'm just going to replace it with an area chart because I think it looks better. That's the equivalent of the 3D conversation we had. Running into where we are from a, from a 3D perspective, how do we um, use an area chart? Well, it's used just as it's meant to be. It's, it is used and designed to be used to show us the sum of the whole and what, how that's broken up and getting a feel for how that comes together. Maps, as I mentioned before, have become one of the most powerful tools in our data visualization toolbox. Being able to quickly recognize utilizing color and size on, overlaid on top of a map, that ability to see very quickly, we're all comfortable with maps, where something occurred, how it occurred, and then being able to overlay lots of data on top. A box and whiskers plot is also really good for understanding distributions. Being able to understand what's falling in different quartiles, which are represented by the box, and finding those outliers and seeing where those outliers occur are the main purposes of the box and whisker plot. When we start to combine chart types, we also get to take advantage of some of the power of data visualization. We get to think about how we can use this line chart to show us sales, but be able to use, I mean, the bar chart to show us sales, but the line chart to show us the percentage of sales till we get to 100% broken down by state. And we can start to see where that 80 20 rule falls in the Pareto chart. But this is just an example. A Pareto chart is just an example of how we can combine elements of two chart types to tell a deeper story being able to see that in our first four states, we're already up in the 50 percentile range of our overall sale. So for our next poll, we have two questions. 
those questions are, bar charts are especially effective when you have data that can be featured in one category. True or false? All right, everybody's voting on that one. All right, and then the second poll question on this poll is, the line chart is a simple, straightforward way to visualize changes in one value relative to another. True or false? All right, it looks like about everybody's voted on that one. Um, we've got 83% that said true on this one, so I think they're correct. In fact, I know they are. All right, moving on. You've heard me mention audience-based visualization. And so as we take all of these different elements, what we've learned about how people perceive information, how we leverage memory, some of the tools that we can use, whether that's chart types or whether it's elements of design being the Gestalt principles, color, form, um, different elements of the visualization, we always have to think about our audience. And in thinking about our audience, what we wanna focus on is who we're talking to. We need to understand that it's not about us. Just because we understand the data that we're trying to share, we've got to make sure that we communicate appropriately the information to someone else. So it's important that it's not about me, it's about our audience. And we have to define our scope. We have to go from general, we have to determine if it's general, if it's specific. We have to take a walk in our audience's shoes. We have to think like they think to deliver good information. We really have to understand business drivers, and most importantly, we have to tell the story by communicating with data. Here you're seeing an example of a data visualization for a manufacturing firm where we're wanting to be able to see exactly where errors and failures are happening on the manufacturing floor and to be able to interact with that data. Thinking about the person who's responsible for those failures overall for the floor and making sure they have the ability to jump in and understand it. When we think about audience-based visualization, we're thinking about, if we're thinking about logistics, we're thinking about how we use a map and how we understand what the key elements are for that business, whether it's revenue or revenue per mile or loads or how well we're in compliance, and where all those loads are happening. And if we're an online retailer, we wanna know how our products are getting reviewed. We have people who are in charge of making sure that we're understanding what products are going well, what products aren't, understanding the whys behind them. Similar to the one I just showed you, the performance metrics. And then ultimately, maybe we're responsible for event planning and in the world where we're going places for educational meetings and conferences where are those people coming from how is that all coming together we have to think about as well not just those audience based but how do we start to incorporate advanced analytics how do we incorporate things like recording every webex session or every go to meeting 
or or every interaction we have with clients and leveraging tools, whether it's all the ones that are available through AWS, Azure, or, or ones we can use ourselves with R or Python, how we can prepare data in a way that allows us to visualize results, asking these deeper questions like, are we really engaging our clients effectively? Are we keeping them engaged? Are we keeping conversations positive? Are we moving those tools to take full advantage of analytics capabilities and then sharing them visually? Because the more complex the advanced analytics get and the deeper the questions get, the more we need to simplify the visualization. We need to be able to use an area chart to show the, the different ratings of sentiment over time, or be able to understand key words that are getting used frequently in, in our interactions with clients. We need to not only think internally about visualization, but how can we think about it externally? How can we take it further? So a lot of times we think just only internally about analytics. How do we do this inside our organization when a lot of times we might need to think about how we take this to customers? How do we create, uh, how do we embed this into portals we might already have for customers? How do we monetize some of the data that we have and make it easy to understand? How do we keep visualization customized so so it becomes part of what we do and what we interact with. Now here's an example of, an of taking these same analytical tools and embedding them to where it's as simple as this, looking at how many patients are in the ER, what the breakdown is in emergency surgery and pediatrics, what rooms are in use, what, is the, what are the results of our most recent surveys to know how we're doing and keeping it in front, but doing it all through a web interface? How do we then challenge this traditional thinking that we have? How do we take views that push the envelope of visualization, but keep best practices in place, but grab attention? Whether we're using a bar chart, that just grabs our attention because it looks like it was on a chalkboard, or we're looking at a scatter plot, or an area chart, or a highlight table. How do we now start to put all of these things together and start to do it in a way that we grab attention? We have to challenge our traditional thinking of putting just reports out there. As we think about data visualization and we wrap up the webinar today, I think it's important that you remember as you walk away today that the power of visual perception is very real. It helps people understand their data much more quickly. It helps them retain it more effectively and it helps them put the information to work and take full advantage of what they're seeing. We have to remember the foundations of storytelling, whether that's in design, whether that's in the elements of design, whether that's pulling everything together. And the most important thing about visualization is remember it's not about you, it's about your audience. We can completely understand something that we can put together, but the question is, is if we walk in someone else's shoes and knowing that most people learn visually more so than with text, how do we help empower those people with visualizations to be successful? I appreciate your time today. We are gonna have time for a few questions. Um, also, I wanted to let everybody know um, we are going to be doing a three-part, an additional three webinars as part of this series of 
analytics and visualization over the rest of the summer months. Please be on the lookout for the invites and the emails that are gonna make, make you aware of when those are going to be. Some of them are yet to be scheduled. If you have any questions, please put those in the questions pod and I'll try and get to them and answer them. Um, and if not, have a, have, a ter if, have a terrific day. All right, I'm not seeing any questions uh, in the questions pod. So hopefully everybody have a fantastic day.